I want you just to use your imagination, or I want you just to think about a problem. You don't even have to use your imagination to do it. But just think about one problem that you have right now. The one thing. One problem, one situation. If Jesus stood right before you and says, what do you want me to do for you? What is coming to your heart? What is coming to your mind? This is a, because I want you just, I felt that earlier we had lunch and I just, any issues you're thinking about, I'm going to give you the answer. Just think about anything right now. Just as soon as you can think about something, wave to me. And anyone else, we're going to pray for your mind afterwards. Okay, now when you have something in your mind, something that you believe can, you need an upgrade. Something, some area could be a financial upgrade. Fin, there could be a health upgrade, a relational upgrade, but there's some areas in your life. Now I want you to focus. Here's what he says to you. He says, I am. Just think about any issues you're thinking about right now. And he says, I am. If you need healing, he says, I am your healer. I am your physician. If you need provision, he says, I am Jehovah Jireh. I am your provider. I am your sufficiency. I'm going to supply all your need. Just think about any issue. You say, I'm hungry. He says, I'm the bread of life. <laughs> I am. If you're thirsty, he says, I am your living water. If you feel burden, you feel pressure, he says, I am your rest. <laughs> he says, come, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. My burden is easy and his yoke is light. But just think about any issue you have, and now you're going to find something about the very nature of who he is. He says, I am. About any of your issue, any of your problem, any of your situation, he says, I am. I want you to think about it right now. Just look up and just see him as the great I am. And then the only response you and I can have in the middle of it, if you can get that, is you are. I want you to say that. It says, it says, you are. He says, I am. But our response is always, you are. You are my healer. You are my strength. You are my salvation. You are my freedom. You are my sufficiency. Just start to think about it. You just start to proclaim. You are. You are. You are. Any issues, start to declare. You are. You are good. <laughs> you are beautiful. Whoa! I, I know some of you just start to think about it, and maybe you start to swirl around a little bit. I know this kind of a thinking is dangerous. It leads to dancing. <laughs> Joyful Christians. And maybe the joy of the Lord becomes your strength. Maybe in His presence there is fullness of joy. <laughs> wow. He says, I am. You and I, we say, you are. And everybody else around us, your family, the people in your workplace or school, the community, everyone else that says, he is. <laughs> I want you to get America will say, he is, when we understand that he says, I am, and we says, you are, and America will say, he is. He is good. He is faithful. He is sufficient. He is a healer. He is. He is. He is. The world will say, he is, when we understand that he is sitting on the throne, and he says, I am. And we respond, oh, feel it. Now I want you to feel it. Some of you are not very good at you. Don't drink and think. Just drink. <laughs> Some of you need to turn off the thinker. Just receive it. You who are thirsty, come and drink. Drink from his sufficiency. Drink from his love. <laughs> Whoa, drink. <laughs> Of his faithfulness. Drink. 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 Let's lift your hands and surrender to a wonderful king. He is a king who is here this evening.
He rules and reigns. <laughs> He's looking so good. <laughs> He's smiling. He's not very nervous right now. He's smiling. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. <laughs> A release right now. Come, Holy Spirit. <laughs> Come, Holy Spirit. <laughs> More. Whoa. More. <laughs> More. <laughs> Come, Holy Spirit. <laughs> Whoa. Just feel it. We're going to learn it is about His presence. And His presence changes everything. There's healing in His presence. Whoa! There's freedom in His presence. There is strength in His presence. There is joy in His presence. In His presence there's always, not just joy, but there is fullness of joy. Feel it. Whoa! <laughs> Baba. <laughs> I want you to say that word with me. Say Baba. That's Swahili, by the way. You're very good in Swahili. I need to tell you that. Just say it again. Say Baba. That's the most childlikeness of all, of all the languages. Uh, when I was there, and I know Pastor Bob has been with me in Tanzania, but when we were there, and I, I remember in one of the groups, uh, there was 3,000 people that needed healing, and they were there, and there were so many children, and, 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 we, were, and we had a very short time before the sun went down. And, and, and all I knew, we didn't have the time to pray for them, and, we, and I was like, how are we going to get this before we go out? And then I just got this word, just get all of them to say Baba. That's how I first learned. So, so I said, what is, it? what is dad or papa in Swahili? And they said, Baba. And I liked this. Like, Baba, I adopted it. I liked it better than Norwegian, which is Papa. Papa. That's like Papa. And I, I like better Baba. Whoa. And then in the next one, they say Baba. And before you know the whole place there, you had... 3,000 people saying, Baba, and their faces started to go. And then afterwards, I never forgot it. I said, how many of you received a healing right now? And all over the place, it was like almost every single person there of the 3,000 that needed to be healed, all of them waved to me. And I told my translator, I said, no, 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 I don't think they understand. I'm not asking how many that I need to pray for, how many needs to be healed. I'm asking how many of them got healed right now when they said, oh, Baba. And all of them waved again. And I'm like, I'm getting a little frustrated here. This translator, I don't know if he... So I say, excuse me, but listen, when I'm asking the people, I'm not asking them to wave if they want to be healed. I'm asking them if... Just the ones that check themselves, if they, if they need to be healed. And all of them waved again. And finally, I, was, I, I, I still don't think they understand. And he said, no, 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 no. It's not... They don't understand. You are the one that don't understand. You told them to say Baba, and when they said Baba, they will be healed. And they have not had all this education to learn why they shouldn't get healed. <laughs> Father, we just thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for the people, story after story. Even last night, uh, <laughs> people being healed or people laying on the floor. One of the people that came up and said, how did you know that? That's impossible. How, how did you know? I mean, nobody knows. I said, well, God knows. And she said, I know God knows. How do you know? I said, well, every little boy and every little girl is hearing what the father is saying. Because we are seeing his face. We're hearing his voice. We're feeling his love. We're experiencing his presence. And we're living in his pleasure. Wow. His presence is here. There's actually the hard work of rest taking place right now. I don't know if some of you know it, but you're receiving. Just taste and see that he is good. Let's give him a good hand. He's worthy, isn't it? Let's give him a good hand. You may be seated if you can. 
Just wave to me for a moment and smile. Let me see. I don't think any one of you need any dental miracles right now. You're doing pretty well. I do that, and even when it's beautiful when you're standing. I, I'm saying this, and you have 60,000 people that are just waving, and their smiles. Then I get them to smile with long beards and everything. They're smiling, waving to me. I love that, and I do it in Africa. I just did it in Thailand, and all over the world. You just, I get them to wave and smile and just connect, and they are so, so beautiful. I love people, and there are so many good friends in here, and it's good to be with family. I've enjoyed my time here. From here, I'm heading to Houston, Texas, Bob, Phil, no, Bob Vineyard. I was almost saying Bob Phillips, but I'm going to Bob Phillips. This is with Bob Vineyard. So I'm going to Houston, Texas, and going to be with my dear friend, uh, Bill Johnson, on Wednesday, and then... Going to be with my friend, uh, my, my spiritual papa, Jack Taylor, and we're going to have a wonderful time there. And so I've just finished about five weeks on a little trip around the world, and I am seeing God moving and working all over the world. I have never been more excited to be alive than right now. This is the best time in the church history. And uh, wow, if, I mean, if you knew what God was doing in America, you would start to do backflips. Even with a bad back, you would do backflips. You get so excited. God is moving and working in America. I've never seen more open heaven in America than right now. I don't find anywhere in history. And some of you are looking at me. I don't think you're reading the same newspaper as me, Brother Leif. <laughs> and by the way, my, my name is Leif. <laughs> in, in case you were thinking that way. Now. I was just in one place, and he said, well, you don't understand. We are in Oregon right now. Don't you know Oregon is one of the most unchurched? I said, Oregon is an open heaven. It depends how you see things. And then I, come, then I went to the south and said, well, you don't understand. This is Alabama. This is, we have, they're very, very close. I mean, this is a very religious area. I mean, we are in the middle of the Bible Belt. Everywhere I go, and then I went right up to Boston. This is actually before. I did two meetings in Boston. And then while I was in Boston, then people are coming up there and talking about, oh, here up in these New England states. Everywhere, everybody's having excuse why they cannot host an open heaven. Everybody's coming up with it and coming up, oh, this is hard or this is difficult. Or we Listen, it is not as though the enemy has the ball and you are on the defense. You are the one with the ball and the enemy is on the defense. And if you know the finished score, even before you start playing, you play different ball that some of you have been lying to. And you're on one. You're, oh, I got beaten up again. Oh, Brother Leif, please pray for me. It's getting so hard. There's so much persecution and hardness, and you don't understand. I had a, my toe is still hurting. And I have just been with a persecuted church where they are dancing that they were worthy to be tortured for Jesus. I was in one meeting where they were filling up the whole front. And these people come up and they were just weeping and weeping because they were not called to be able to be dying for Jesus. And they were mourning that they were not called, that they had to be home and support the other one that was going. When they're pulling out the fingernails, I have a picture in my Bible here of a little girl. When they are taking this little girl, pull her outside in the front of the parents, take her away, the little girl, 12 years old, not hit the puberty, from your country. And then in the next moment, four Muslim, grown up, they rape and abuse her to the most brutal, brutal way. Then later on afterwards, when she goes to the hospital, she's going to have a death sentence. And you say, oh, that is so bad. And this is so horrific. It is horrific. It is very bad. That's one of the reasons we go with the light and the love. And I have the picture with me in the Bible because I paid a hospital bill. I paid the bills and helped this family. I just showed, yes, two days ago. I've shown twice the video. I just came from the St. Joseph colony where the believers, when they came in there, we, we just visited around and I talked to the different people. But when they came in there on March 9th, March 8th, they started hearing the news, and they burned down 200 of their homes. Everything they have is burned up. And they're living there in fear. They have absolutely nothing. Living in rumble. There is no mattress. There's nothing left. Everything's been burned down. 
And I'm meeting with a different people that has been tortured for Jesus. And I cannot even mention a name, but in September, I'm going into another country where there's a movement of 250,000 people. They said, we're going to give you 5,000 of our pastors, evangelists, and leaders. Nobody will be able to come to your meetings in these two areas unless they've been tortured for Jesus, been in prison. Not one single person will be able to be there that has not experienced major torture for Jesus. And then I'm coming back to America and people say, oh, touch me, bless me, fill me. It's getting hard. We're hoping that Jesus can come and rescue us. And I'm like, we're living under open heaven. When people talk about the religious spirit, let me show you the Taliban. And you see, you don't know what the religious spirit is. And I'm saying sometimes there's a culture chalk to come home. Because everywhere I go, I, I've never been to a place that is close. I've never been to one single place where light is not stronger than darkness. I've never been to one single place where perfect love does not cast out fear. I have never experienced one single place. But there's places when they have that mentality and you have a religious mentality where you see less than other places. But the limitation is not on God's end. It is just our ends to believe and to have faith. I was just with one Sudanese boy in Houston, Texas that I wanted to travel to Houston because I heard he was there. And I'd heard that he had led over 200,000 people to Jesus in southern Sudan. And I decided, I, I, I called my friend Dr. Bob Phillips and he set up a dinner appointment for this young, I'm saying boy, but he's 30 years old in his early 30s. But this boy, he was taken from Gulu, Uganda as a little boy. He was kidnapped as a little child. And then they started to torture and beat him. And then eventually they blindfolded him. And he had to be forced to shoot with a machine gun. And afterwards they showed him the people he had killed from they were children. They are the child soldiers from the liberation army. So he was kidnapped and put in. And then all the most horrific things that human beings can ever experience. Later on he escaped. From this very place, and as a little young boy, not hardly hit puberty, he's out in the jungle by himself, that he lived there out in the jungle for the next year. And one day when he was able to, with fear and everything else, find civilization, and by the way, before he found civilization, he had some experiences out there in that jungle. But when he came there and they met, and somebody was telling him about Jesus, and they found him, and they brought him to a place where people were telling him about Jesus, he said, I already know Jesus. And they said, where did you know Jesus? He said, every single day for the last year, me and Jesus been together in the jungle. And he knew this book better than the missionaries that was telling him about Jesus. He has led 200,000 people to Jesus, leading one of the top two move of God's spirit in Sudan today. Not somebody that know how to read and write a book. That's not how he learned it. He met the living book. And every single day he talked to the living book. So I'm telling you just some stories because it fascinates me to travel around the world to meet people that has been raised from the dead. People that has been in the grave. And now I'm saying, how was it to be in grave? <laughs> how do, I mean, this is a good hobby. Better than collecting stamps. <laughs> I stopped collecting stamps when I found out about people who was raised from the dead all over the world. And I decided this is more fun to go and listen to what they have to say. Hearing their stories. And then I want to hear the people that raised people from the dead. My friend Suprason, Pastor Reagan, I know David Hogan, he was just in De Denver while we were here. Uh, they texted me, and David Hogan, they have several hundred people in Mexico that has been raised from the dead. And it's just happening all over the world. More people have been raised from the dead in the last 10 years. And I think we need some resurrection life in the church right now. Because I think there's people that are spiritual dead that needs to become alive. They are almost half asleep on the enemy's lap. And I'm just saying that as an encouragement because this is the time to be alive. This is the time to wake up in the morning and you say, well, we got some issues. So do I. That's why I focus on him. I need him. I'm a needy person. I wake up in the morning. Baba. Here we are again. Here I am, your favorite one. What about me? Uh, you can be one too. <laughs> I had an experience, and today I'm going to actually talk a little bit about, I'm going to talk about a love style 
that will transform the world. How do you love your life away? How do you love your life away? Because I think that the biggest cure to the disease we have in America is start loving people. I think we've become very self-centered. It is about us. Touch me, bless me, fill me. The reason we are coming is what can I get? Give me, give me, give me. Instead of what can I give? We're coming to see to be blessed. Instead of how can I come today to the service tonight to be a blessing to someone? We are coming here to get value. Instead of coming, how can I come and add value to everybody else that is around me because I'm so valuable? We're living from measure because we don't know how to live from fullness. We're living towards inheritance instead of from inheritance. We're asking God to bless what we are doing instead of doing what God is blessing. And I could just go on and on. And then we get discouraged by circumstances because we don't know how to change circumstances. And then we have storms on the inside so we don't have actually authority of the storms on the outside. Because you only have authority over storms you can sleep in. Ask Jesus. But I had a radical revelation on love and I was telling Pastor Bob and some people that's when it started. Uh, I just, I, I love God. But it is an impossibility. But I tell you one story and I don't want to mention because I know on the internet people are watching the name and the place. But I was in a very, very dark place in a country where they have a different religion than me. And in this country, I was invited to meet one of the religious leaders in that nation. And when I came to his place, we were sitting around, and, uh, and, and he has been a friend since the 1990s, one of the top leaders in the world in his religion. And when we sat together, I just, I could feel this love towards him. And I looked into these dark eyes, and the leaders was around. He told me the sadness that his son had been electrocuted, and he was in coma in that city, in that hospital. And I visited the hospital after I got the prayer. I said, excuse me. And I told him his name. I said, Could, would it be okay for me first to pray here? Then I want to go to the hospital. So what all these other religious leaders was there, I just released, Father, in the name of Jesus. I just release right now your presence. And we went eventually to the hospital, and I got to pray in the hospital. And I wish I could say something happened. I didn't see. He was on ventilator, has been for two months, and was also quadriplegic as a result of that fall. And uh, now we left there, and we went to the capital city, and we were sitting, some of us, the next morning at the breakfast table. This is about eight hours away from this city. And as we were sitting together, I had been one verse, and I don't know what you are drilling for. My friend Bill Johnson, the people that know him, Bill Johnson for over 30 years has had one message that's heaven on earth. Whatever is in heaven, I want to see it on earth. He will spend the rest of his life to drill for one thing, and that is to be able to see that the kingdom is coming, and his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And since there is no cancer in heaven, they're creating a cancer-free zone here on earth. And you can say, well, how is it going? Well, thousands and thousands of people have been healed. And thousands of people are being sent all over the world. And they have schools of supernatural ministry. Because one man has a dream. And a whole army of people have a vision for that dream. Because Bill Johnson, my friend, he is a one thing man. And he goes after sickness and diseases and everything else, but he's drilling for something. My friend Randy Clark is drilling for something else. So what is it that you're waking up every single morning, you're waking up with passion, and you're drilling towards something? And in the next 30 years, whatever, you spend your life for it. You will be focused. You will give everything for it. And for me, I share with Pastor Bob, John 17, 26 has been my verse, and I wanted just to read it to you. This has been the verse. Seven years I've been, I've been going after this one verse. The rest of my life, I will not learn the book. I used to spend time reading the Bible from cover to cover. I used to, in Bible college, seminary, I learned uh, apologetics and hermeneutics and all these nice words. Now I have one verse. If I can do that the rest of my life, I'm not concerned about anything else. I've become a one-thing man. 
There's one thing I desire. There's one thing I long for. There's something that I'm drilling for that I guarantee you before I die, I'm going to be able to get hold of it. So for seven years, I've been going after one verse, but I still don't understand this verse. I still don't have full grasp of it. And I'm sitting there after seven years, and I'm sitting in this capital city. And you will know where it is, Islamabad. And I'm sitting at Marriott Hotel at the breakfast table, sitting around with my team. And I'm just so overwhelmed because John 17, 26 is there in the front of me. And for seven years, every single day, I've been crying out. For, I've been crying out to God, I want this. This is my desire. And let me start actually some verses before. Verse 24, he says, Father, this is Jesus. Father, I desire... That they, say they, they, that's me and you, that they also whom you gave me would be with me where I am. That you and me, they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you have loved me before the foundation of the world. Oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you. They not know the Papa. They not know the Father. But I have known you, and these has also known that you have sent me. So now the world is about to know that the Father sent the Son. They know the Son, but they didn't know the Father. So Jesus is saying, and then the verse comes in. This is my verse. And I have declared to them, I have declared to them your name, Father. Papa, Papa, I have declared. I've had one vision, and that was your dream, Papa. That's what Jesus, he was a one man. He had one vision, and that was the dream of his Father. And this is the very desire. Father, I this one thing. I have declared your name. I have declared your name among them. And I continue to declare it. Father, that the very love, Papa, that you have towards me, the very love that you, Father, has towards me, that love is going to be in them. This is my verse. Just think about it. The very love, Father. And I can be honest. You can have a Bible study, but I would spend the next 30 years of my life every single day drilling for this one verse. Father, that the very love, Father, that you have towards the Son, the very love that the Son has towards the Father, that that love is going to be in me, and Christ in me, the hope of glory, and Him in me. I don't know if you're getting it, because somehow, if you were going to get this one thing, you maybe could get another verse when you get to heaven. But if you do not get this verse, you have not got the point of what it's all about. Your life is actually pretty pointless. If you do not understand that there is a father that loved the son, there is a love that the son has towards his father, that you and I, there would be an impossibility for you and I if the father didn't love you. And he loved you so much that he had a dream when he saw even before the foundation of the world, he saw you and I. He saw the world. He saw something that he wanted to restore back to himself. He saw a treasure. He wanted, and he loved his son. The son loved his father. They had perfection back from eternity past in heaven where there was no sickness, no disease, no pain, no poverty. There was no issue. The father wanted this model, and he wanted to see it here on earth. And he created a place, and then eventually the fall came in, and now the Father has a dream to restore back again everything that he created from the beginning. So here he is, and the Father is looking at the Son. The Son is looking at his Father. And the Father, he's just, he's thinking about you. He sees my face, he sees your face, and he's looking at his Son. And he knows our issues. He knows our problems. He knows our shame. He knows our diseases. He sees the problems of the world. The son has a vision for his father dreams. The old dream dreams and the young see vision. And what is happening with the son? The father is sending his son. But the son is perfectly willing to go. Why am I saying this? What does this have to do with that day sitting at the table? I'm saying that for seven years, I've been in every verse and language and everything else trying to get hold of one verse. And the next 30 years, I want to find out what kind of a love was there in heaven between the father and the son. Because that love is supposed to be in me and him in me. All my life, I will learn that one thing. That one thing. That one thing, I'm going after it. I'm drilling after it. And there's going to be a whole generation of people around the world that is going to know how that looks like, how it feels like. Before I get to heaven, I guarantee you something. There's going to be oil available for all of us. And that oil is called love. 
And you're going to see it's going to be poured in. It's going to restore. Whoa. It's going to bring what the world would see that we are his disciple because we have learned how to love with that kind of a love. So I'm sitting there in the Islamabad at the Marriott Hotel. We're sitting around. And I'm looking at this verse again. And again. Seven years. I thought you could maybe go to another verse. But no, no, no. The rest of my life are one verse. I'm drilling for one thing. If this is what I want to spend my life legacy. That I've been such a son towards my father. That what is his dream has become my vision. And I'm willing to leave everything to be able to. Because it is that love thing that drives me. That love thing, the way that he loves me. But he was about to give me an upgrade in love. And let me just stretch some of you in this. I am sitting at the hotel and my guys, we're eating beautiful breakfast in a nice hotel. We're in a safe environment. There's five different security you have to go through to get to our breakfast area. And we're sitting there. So it's a safe place. And I'm sitting and suddenly this verse comes to mind. But now the Father is about to give me revelation. Say revelation. revelation. Not information, but revelation. Say revelation. revelation. Because revelation leads to transformation. Now it's the Father that is about to reveal this love. It is an impossibility for me to love people, to love my enemy, to love my president, to love a Congress, a Senate. It's impossible for me to love a Saul. When you're looking at the terrorist Saul, can you see the Apostle Paul? Then you don't have the love glasses. When you don't treat people based upon their destiny but their history. When you see people the way they are instead of the way they're going to be. I'm sitting there just so overwhelmed. And then my tears starts to flow. Because God is about to reveal something about his love to me. He says, uh, and, and I know God when he speaks to me, it's not because he lacks answer. It is for me to find the answer. But he just brings me to my son. I have one son and three daughters. He took me when my son was younger. And I sometimes miss that stage, that age. When he was first about seven and then nine, these memories. And I'm just sitting at the, and my team is saying, what is wrong with you? I said, no, I'm just thinking. <laughs> I'm just getting overwhelmed. Tears is there. I'm just thinking about my son. I, I miss my son. Leif Emmanuel is his name. Leif is after me and then Emmanuel, God with us. So my, my son Leif Emmanuel, Leif means beloved like David, the beloved God is with us. So when I'm thinking about him, then suddenly, and I know Bobby, Pastor Bobby has been praying for my son a lot. And then I start to think about him now as an adult and my buddy, my son. And I just like sitting with tears and my team like, uh, are you, I mean, you're sitting right here in front of everybody just crying. And I say, yeah, I, I know it's a love thing. I don't know. <laughs> I just miss my boy. He's just so, I have only one son. And, he said, I'm so amazing. And then God speaks. He said, would you take your only son, Leif Emmanuel? Would you let him become quadriplegic for him to be a vegetable the rest of his life? To be on ventilator the rest of his life so that this top leader's son can be well? Would you take that 19-year-old that you just saw on television, and that 26-year-old, by the way, would you uh, take your son, would you trade places for them and let them become? Then become free from all the things they just did. And your son get the death sentence, the penalty, and everything they deserved. Some of you are looking strange at me. This is exactly. Would you take Leif Emmanuel? I'm sitting there and weeping. Would you take your only son? And this guy that I just met with his son in the hospital the day before. Would you swap places? And I can be honest with you. I just got so overwhelmed. I said, Papa, I don't know how to love this way. You cannot love with that kind of a love unless it first comes from him. You love because you've first been loved. You can try the best that you can. You can do this. Oh, I would do anything. Or do. That's cliche. 
You cannot love with a perfect love. You can just love with a human love to the best of your ability. This love can only come from your father. Would you do that exchange? I don't know if you have a child. I don't know if you have a favorite grandchild, but he pointed to, to the only son I have. And, and, and not talking about do it for somebody that you like. Or, or kidney. I'm talking about these very two boys that you saw on television. I'm talking about here is somebody from a totally different religion, somebody from a totally different background, somebody with dark eyes, and their son is from a totally different that you don't know. Would you do that trade? And I just got so overwhelmed. And I said, Papa. And then liquid love just started to touch me. And I just sit there just weeping and weeping. I realized I was giving something, an upgrade in love. And I just felt that, oh, wow. What is this, Papa? And I just sit there just overwhelmed by the love. This is the kind of love that I had. Barabbas, Barabbas, you know the terrorist Barabbas? Let him be set free. Let that innocent Jesus, let him be guilty. Let's put all the cancer on him, all the pain, all the suffering, all the, everything, every disease of the world, let's place it on him. Every sin, everything that is of meanness and everything else, so the terrorists could become free, so sinners could become free. This is normal Christian life, the divine exchange. That the father loved so much that he gave. But the son was perfectly willing to go. The son was willing to pay the price. Because the father had a dream and the son had a vision. I don't know if you're hearing these kind of messages in America. But if we do not experience this kind of love, we're not going to change the atmosphere. This is love. This is a God of love. This is the love that Jesus is praying. I want us to get John 17, 26. That the very love, Father, that you have towards me and he has towards the Son. That love is the very thing. When he looked at the very one that he came to save. The very one that he healed. He came there to love on the people. And instead, they treated him as a terrorist. They treat him and they gave him the worst death sentence. Watch the passion video over and over again. I've done it every day afterwards. I watched it. I watched it over and over and over. Seven minutes of the worst crucifixion scene. And start to see what God was willing to do to his son so the terrorists could become set free. Not just the terrorists. You and I was Barabbas. It was our sin. But the biggest pain was when he was separated from his father. And the father's love. He says, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Honestly speaking, is this the way you love your enemies? Is this what we are, flo- is this how we love one another? Is this the prayer that Jesus is praying that this kind of a love is going to be in you and I? The very love that the Father has towards his son, that radical love is going to be in us. Is that the kind of a love that the world is going to see that we are his disciples because we've learned how to love with this kind of a love? Lay down lovers. Sacrificial love. Not seeing people the way they are, but the way they're going to be. Starting to treat people based upon the destiny, destiny, not their history. I got so overwhelmed. But here's what happened. As I was sitting there weeping, I appear eight hours away before this top imam I don't know if you got that I'm sitting at the breakfast table in one city and in another city when I'm just sitting there my face is filled with tears receiving this love I appear before him he sees me and he calls up right at a moment swear to Allah that he had a vision and a dream and described that something has changed with the very nature of who he is and still today. I was just reading. I have my book called Baptism of Love. And I was reading the story about Moody. I was reading the story about Charles Finney. I was reading the spirit. Just a, the baptism of love. So let me just share. Because some of us have not experienced what Finney is describing here. It just changed his life. Wow. No words. This is Charles Finney. 
No words can express the wonderful love that was shed abroad in my heart. I wept aloud with joy and love. And I do not know, but I should say, I literally bellowed out unutterable gutterings of my heart. Those waves came over me. These waves just came over me and then over me and over me. And after it was over, I recollect, I cried out, I shall die if these waves continue and if they do not stop. I could die if these waves didn't stop. These waves are the very love that the Father has towards the Son, this liquid love. Lord, I cannot be here anymore. When was the last time, honestly speaking, that heaven opened up over you and waves of liquid love came over you in such a way that you were so messed up, waves after waves of God's love and goodness towards you just flowed over heaven, that you are there crying and crying and you're so undone by these waves and waves and waves. They won't stop and your body cannot handle it. You think you're literally going to die because the, the flood, it's not talking about a tickle, but it is like a fire host of love Love, liquid love that is flooding in to the deepest root area in your life and you have no fear in your life. When was the last time? Then I'm reading about D.L. Moody before the meeting. Moody is describing some of the same thing and he got so ruined and wrecked by the love that he was afraid that he was going to die. And I have my own story in there and other people's story but what I'm about to say is that John 17, 26... I want to live a life well loved. That's, I just want to live a life well loved. The world is about to see we are his disciple by the way we love one another. The great commandment is very simple. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Let me ask you something. When you look in the mirror, are you very excited about what you're seeing? How do you treat you? How do you love you? Give yourself a good hug right now. Let me try to give yourself a good hug. Maybe kiss your hand a little bit too. You need it. <laughs> I'm afraid to let you loose on each other. I mean, I'm a little nervous about that, but <laughs> I'm more the conservative type. I just, I just want you to know, I was in England, actually, Bill Johnson and Randy Clark. We were doing a healing school in England, and, and some of you have heard me telling this story before. But, I had the, the, but we had to close about 1,000 leaders in Central Hall in Southampton, England. And these people are so proper, and they're so... <laughs> they're British. And one of the guys, he came up to me, and, and he kind of triggered it because I was going to finish the event and the conference. And he came up to me and said, would you pray for me? I said, sure, I would love to pray for you. I'm about to pray for you. Ooh, that's enough, thanks. As <laughs> soon as he felt a little bit of the presence, I mean, he ran off. So I realized, whoo, we have an issue here. <laughs> There's some love deficits. There's some love deficiencies. So I said to my team, can I get eight bottles of water? That was the first time I did it public. I need to confess it. I gave a sloppy wet kiss to every single one. I told him, put your jacket over your head if you don't want it, but I'm after you. You need a little bit of the love. I can see it on your faces. <laughs> you don't even need what, you don't need what we read about here. Or the little finny, the whole, just a little drop of love. One drop of love would change it forever. And you want just more of his love. You cannot love the Lord your God with all of your heart. Unless that you know how much he loves you. Unless you first receive the love, it comes from him, it goes through him, and it goes back to him. Then we went to Scotland. When I came to Scotland in Edinburgh, it was even colder weather and colder people. Need to be honest, we shouldn't lie. So when I came in there, I came a little late because I started to speak in the healing school. I think I started on Thursday morning or so. So that was my time. So I came in a little late on Wednesday and the school had started and, and the people were outside and I went up and said, hi, so good to see you. It's like, who are you to talk to us? We don't know you. And I went up to shake somebody. They were, I was like, wow, this is a very friendly audience. And I remember well, I'm Norwegian, so I'm from colder weather than they are. 
And I remember how I used to be. You can talk to my wife about it. If my wife was sitting with me in 1999, Edgewood Baptist Church, we were sitting together and we had been married for a long time and she is a good southern girl and here her Norwegian husband. <laughs> the way we are as Norwegians, so if you think that I'm strange and weird and do all these weird things, I was very proper. I went to the conservative Southern Baptist College and Seminary. <laughs> That's where I came from. Cessationist. We didn't believe in some of this stuff. So my wife, she was just like, here's my husband. And so she's leaning towards me, and I'll lean in the opposite direction. <laughs> no affection in public. Hugging a Norwegian is like hugging a tree stump. <laughs> we have cold weather. We are not like the Latinos. Actually, I met a sister from Romania. I remember we had, in my Baptist church in Norway, First Baptist Church in Norway, we had a choir from Romania. And there was this heavy set from Bistritza. No, it was from Desh, Romania. So these, these per person come from Desh, from a little place, and, and they came up to us. And we were giving a $5,000 check to them for their church as a Baptist church. So we came up to ward them with a check they were going to take back to Romania. He got so happy in front of all of our people. He kissed me right on the lips. And I was like, I almost fainted and got a whiplash. <laughs> That's the first time I was kissed by a man. I'm just telling you some stories to warm you up to be ready for tonight. I see some of you are looking at a watch. I mean, you are a target. You're getting first. You better hurry out now before I come. The offering is taking. I'm not nervous. I, I just came from Pakistan. You cannot scare me with your faces. With these. You just become the target, so you better act like you're smiling. Maybe you become second on the list if you just put on an act. So in Edinburgh, I told the people because they were like, whew, they told me this atmosphere, well, it's going to take a little time. I said, oh, just wait. <laughs> when it's over here in Edinburgh, I see just an army of lovers. But after my story, you read in a book, this, when you met me in year 2000, when I had my baptism of love experience and the same liquid love that all these years, Pastor Bob, that I was even in the Baptist college and seminary, I had read the stories of Finney and Moody. They were some of my heroes. And I remember when Charles Finney, he's just walking through this factory and liquid love is just, whoa, flowing all over, all over the place. People are just being wrecked, just walking through a factory and people were getting saved. And I remember reading these stories and wanted this. I wanted it so badly, but I did not know how to do this. This was just in the history books, but there was something in me when I read those stories. Even as a dried up Baptist, I wanted that love, that, that liquid love. I, I don't know if I, my body could handle that much, but if I could just get a drop of what he had. And it happened in the year 2000 and now all over the world. <laughs> Starting in England, Edinburgh, I just changed and transformed. They stood out on the street. They wouldn't let go of me. All these people, Scottish, stood in the street when I left three days later, all the way out into the street, hugging me, crying all over the place, totally wrecked by love. And from there, I've been on a journey all over the world. Love never fails. That means love always wins. Love keeps no record of wrong. Let me ask you. Is there any individual person, if they were coming into this room, you would tense up a little bit because of issues? Is there anyone that has hurt you or hurt someone in your family, hurt one of your kids? Love keeps no record of wrong. Love keeps no record of wrong. Love never fails. That means love always wins. It always hopes. It always perseveres. There's so many amazing stories that I could share about the love and what a love is doing and what is done in my own marriage and in my own children and how this is spreading. <laughs> but I do not think until this becomes a love style that we have, that we wake up in the morning and we're just thinking about, wow, I look forward to find somebody that I can just leak a little bit of love on. Just leak a little bit. 
Change the atmosphere because of the atmosphere. Love come in and fear moves out. Because your atmosphere is coming in and you are love. It's not study about love. It's becoming love. As I am, so are you. Jesus' prayer was that the very love the Father has towards the Son, but also the very love that the Son has towards the Father, that love is going to be in us. That's what his prayer is. How many of you believe that Jesus is going to get his prayer answered? Or do you think Jesus prayed something to the Father he didn't expect to see? Honestly. But what kind of love is that, that the Father would send his only begotten Son? But what kind of a love is that for the Son to be perfectly willing to go? What kind of a love is that? Is that, Ralph, the love we sing about? Is that love the one we're waking up when you're seeing the news? That you're seeing towards these people. They're like lost sheep without a shepherd. When you're seeing the darkness in people, you're recognizing they never experienced this love. I'm going to have to demonstrate love tomorrow. I'm going to be tested in many different ways where love is going to be tested. And so are you. But are you known if I ask your spouse, if I ask all the people at your workplace, would they say, whoa, that person, when he's coming in, it just changes the atmosphere. Oh, my husband. I mean, after he had that love encounter, he's just, ooh. Is it Paulette? Huh? Yeah, so it was correct, Paulotte, I remember. I still remember her down in the aisle. And how was your ear afterwards? Have you been? Still great. So she was partial deaf three years ago or something? Or about three years ago. It was just here. And then I remember we walked over. I just saw her and I could feel the weight and the heaviness and everything else. We walked over and, 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 and she was just standing there just... I didn't pray for her to be healed or anything else. Just release the love. And she went down and she just started experiencing this liquid love. And suddenly she screamed because the deafness was gone. And then I started to minister to her when she was little. And she, I mean, all these things in her life that only God knew about. We started to read it and then pouring love into those areas. And she is here three years later just, whoa. You can talk to my wife. She's with me on Wednesday. Ask which one she liked the best. The one before year 2000 or after. <laughs> Ask my kids. Ask the people that are working for me. I love the people working in my office. The way I treat them. The way that I honor them. Ask the Muslim wall. I have a whole stack of letter from the top. I'm going to show you Pastor Bob tonight. From the top Muslim organization. Minhaj ul Quran from the Sharia Law College, from all of those places, there's letters there, you know, all these headquarters. Do you know what they do? They write a letter, you saw it up on the video. From the government, Prime Minister Gilani was in a meeting. Do you know what they said? Here, today, the ambassador of the love. They say, the love. <laughs> That's Urdu translated into English. He was saying English. And then I'm coming up there to speak, and you have all those different people. When they're looking towards you, you change the atmosphere because the atmosphere you are at. Wow, here I am, Papa, your favorite one. Let me tell you about my hero in the New Testament, and then we're going to release this love tonight. I'm just whetting your appetite. I'm telling a few stories. My favorite person in the New Testament, I've changed hero. Three years ago, I changed person that I've fallen in love with. His name is John. How many of you like John? <laughs> and the reason is after I became a lover, before it was more like the Peter. Let's get the sword. <laughs> Let's get that ear off that person. <laughs> oh, look at that person in the, in the White House now. I mean, oh, wow. I'm the warrior. I'm the eagle. <laughs> now I'm the lamb. Bah. And by the way, <laughs> if you want to be a Eagle on the outside, you need to be a lamb on the inside. That's what Jesus was. The lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Intimacy, authority, lamb, eagle, lean back, receive, give. This is the rhythm of heaven. Boa. Uh, if I continue, there's maybe waves that will mess you up a little bit, so I better slow. <laughs> I don't think some of you can handle that much. Of. If you read a book of Matthew, 
You will never find in the book of Matthew that Matthew says, I'm the one that he loves. I'm the disciple he loves. You will never find Mark. Read the book of Mark. You never find Mark saying, well, I'm the one that he loves. Then see Dr. Luke. I mean, he should know a little bit better. I mean, he's well educated. In the book of Luke, third book in the New Testament. You never find Luke talking about it. Here, I'm the one that he loves. But you read in the book of John, oh, the disciple whom he loved. <laughs> and then again, and then again, five different times he's expressing, here, I am the favorite one. Woo! <laughs> I can see John. Oh, there was some religious spirit that went, oh, sorry, I forgot. I forget where. Norwegian cannot move like that. That's just, just lovers. I'm just seeing who's becoming target. It's just a test. And then I see John. But here, let me just tell you a few things about John. And we're going to land this. This is what fascinates me. When it came to the most important thing in the life of Jesus, John over and over again, by the way, says, I'm the one that he loves. But the most important thing to Jesus, it's not who is going to be the apostle or who I'm going to be entrusted with signs, wonders, and miracles. There was one thing that concerned Jesus. And you know, who is going to take care of my mama? You read about it in the book of John. So when Jesus knew he was going to go away, who would he entrust with his mama? This was the day before Mother's Day. I was in Colorado with my friend Heidi Baker and a bunch of other my friends. We were doing a conference in Colorado Springs. And I was tired because we had been from conference to conference, city to city. And there was a lot of people. And late at night, I came to my room. And, and then the next day, I was going to speak. And, and finally, I decided I need to be in the presence of God to make sure I have some oil. Because, whoo, there is so many people that just... They, they just needed a touch. They needed oil and oil and oil everywhere. And you were just giving away oil more than you were taking in. And there was no time to be with my lover. Since I've been here today, I've already had four or five hours with my lover. Hope I'm up. So it's been a wonderful time here because I've had plenty of time just to be. Just drinking. No agenda. Just to be in his presence. Pastor Bob comes early to pick me up just to come and sneak into my room. <laughs> just to be in that. He does. He sits in the chair and he's like, "Ooh!" I mean, every, every, so everyone that loves his presence, they want to be with Jesus. We're spending hours there. And, and here I see John because I'm, I'm laying on the floor and I can't get peace. I can't feel his presence. And I know I'm supposed to have a message. And then it's all this. I start to pray in the spirit. Oh, kashaba baba. But there's nothing. And then in the next moment, I try everything to, but there's nothing. And I'm a little nervous. Let me soak. Be still to know that I'm God. It didn't work. There was no present. I mean, I tried every way to attract heaven, but I'm there. And, and I know that I'm supposed to give. And there's all these different people and have all these names, Cheon and Heidi and this and that. And, and then there's going to be me. <sighs> but I have no dove. There's just pigeons in my room. Then there is a voice, that still a voice that I've learned to listen to. I say, uh, son, could I entrust you with my mother? And I'm like, <laughs> I wonder where this voice came from. But I heard a second time. Son, could I entrust you with my mama? Third time. It's like, where's this coming? I know it's an inner voice. I've learned to, but I didn't know, is this the devil? Or should I rebuke it? Or is this, what is my mama, mother, what does this have to do with anything? I'm here just, and the fifth time it hit me. And it was right before Mother's Day. So what I did is trying to see, maybe this is going to solve something. So I called on my phone to, my mama is in Norway. And I called Norway and said, Hallo, mor, gratulera med mors dag. Ek savne deg så mye, mor. Ek savne spesielt denne kake med den gule krem. Gratulera med mors dag, mor. I know, don't look at me that way. You're spirit filled, aren't you? <laughs> I said, Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I just miss you so much. I'm just laying here thinking about you. You're amazing, Mom. But I miss that cake with a yellow cream that you make. <laughs> and I wish I could have been there with you. I just, I just, still a mama boy, 47 years old. 
just talked to my mama from the hotel room. And, and then in the next moment, I called my wife and I said, hey, happy Mother's Day. I, I miss you. And I'm just here. I'm lonely. I'm in a room. I have no, there's no presence. All these people are out there. And I'm just, I miss you. I wish I could be home. And I know tomorrow all the kids are going to be at home, but I just wish I could be there with you guys. And it's painful. It's lonely sometimes to be here. I, happy Mother's Day. I, I miss you, hon. She said, I miss you too. I love you and I love you. And I just didn't want to hang out. And I'm laying on the floor. And that voice said again, could I entrust you with my mother? And then it took me right to the scripture. That's where the good Baptist comes in me. Behold, mother, this is your son. Behold, son, this is your mother. From that very moment on, the apostle changed his apostolic calendar and he started a hospitality business to take care of what is the most valuable thing to Jesus, his mom. Everything was changed. The agenda changed. But why was it? Why was it John? Why was it not Jesus' own brothers, half-brothers? Why not Peter? Why not? Why John? I'm laying on the floor. And then he just takes me on a journey. It is like being with John himself. I remember when he had the thunder sons, the brothers was together. Well, and so I'm having this whole journey. I'm laying on the floor in Colorado. There at Crown, Crown Plaza Hotel, up in my hotel room, laying on the floor, going on a walk with John through his life. And I get this whole picture, and I can see when John has his baptism of love experience, and eventually comes, I'm the one that he loves, and whoa! And John had his attitude among the disciples. Jesus had multitudes. Jesus had 72. They got signs, wonders, and miracles. And there are many of you that have that. Gifts. Wow, powerful, good for you. Then there was 12. He called them to follow before fishing. He called them to be family. It was 12 that hanged around, and they were his community. They was his core group. He poured his life into them. When he left the multitudes, he was with the 12. It was the one that they were with, the one they were becoming like. They loved him, and he loved them. And they walked with him, and they saw all the amazing things. And then there was the three, and he took me on a journey in the three. Only Peter, James, John got to experience the Mount on Transfiguration. Only Peter and James, John got to be there when Lazarus was raised from the dead. I went on a journey where only three got to experience. But then there was that one. There was only one, and that was a John. Jesus had only one John. When it comes to his mama... It was not the three, it was not the twelve, it was not the seventy-two, it was not the multitude, it was a John. I want you to find why John. And I realized I have been on a journey, the wall. I remember when I got the seventy-two, signs, wonders, and miracles. I remember when I got the glory realm, Malaysia, the first time glory came in. Everybody was glued, nobody could move for two and a half hours. The weight of the glory. It's happening 13 times. January was the last time. Castro, Colorado, Monday. People were taken up to heaven in a meeting. It's a beautiful, nice, seeker-friendly mega church. I love the glory. I love when the weight comes in. I love when cancer just disappears. Nobody can move because heaven is invading earth. I love it all. But there's one thing I love more, and that's what John had. And here's the secret of John's life. Because God says, I want you to raise up a culture of people like John. Not just a man after my own heart, but a culture after my own heart. And I want you to have what John had. And number one is he had identity. Say the word identity. Amen. He knew who he was and whose he was. He knew I'm the one that he loves. There can be 200 people in a room like this, but I know I'm the favorite one. And you can say, what about me? You should know the same thing. If you have the same thing that John had. If you've had the same experience. If you've had the same love that Charles Finney had. If you've had the same, you would know that you know that of all the 7 billion people in this world, there's only one person like you. And you are it. Each one of my four kids, they have that with me. They feel it. They sense it. They see it in the look. So that was number one. The second thing what John was. Here in the leadership meeting, all the disciples, the apostles are gathering around Jesus. And they have the CEO meeting of the apostles. And then the big question comes up. One of you are about to betray me. <gasps> who is it? Peter is like, who is it? And then John does something interesting. He climbs up. I can see he climbs up on the lap of Jesus. Lean his head into the bosom. Into the chest of Jesus. 
Guess who gets the answer? Not the one that asked the question, but the one that have learned how to lean. Do you know how to lean? When every issue goes on in America, can you be the lover that have such a relationship with him that all you do is climbing into his presence and going in and leaning your head and knowing his heartbeat about any situation? I don't know if that's you. Would he entrust you with this move of God's spirit here in Winchester? Would you steward what is the most valuable to him? Would you take care of his mama? Will you change your calendar around? Or are you too busy for the move? I mean, we're praying for this very thing, but why is it that God is not hearing? Don't you think he wants it more than we do? Could it be because that what is the most valuable to him is not the most valuable to us? Would we steward and take care of that? We will lean. So number one, identity. Number two, intimacy. Say intimacy. This is the thing we're going to get. Say identity. Intimacy. John had intimacy with Jesus in a way that nobody else had. That's the secret why he was entrusted. Number three, fellowship of the sufferings. I know we don't like to talk about this, but John was the only one at the cross. Where are the rest of the people? When there's hard, when there's crucifixion, when the pain is, when the very lover is, when it costs everything, nobody else wants to follow him, when they treat him as a criminal, when suddenly he is on the top of the terrorist list, who will identify with him? Where are they going to go? But John is the only one. And I can see John, and I'm laying on the floor in Colorado, just wrecked, watching the very thing as John is keeping, he's following after, he's seeing Jesus, he sees. And I can see John just thinking, he wants to scream, I, I am the one that is supposed to be on that cross, not you, Jesus. I can feel John. I can feel his heart. I'm laying there, I'm just wrecked by the love. And the love that Jesus has towards him to look. John was the one at the resurrection. And we could just go on and on. I have... My friend Bill Johnson, he heard me in Australia speaking this, and he says, you need to write a book. And I am in the process, just I've been on a journey with John for three years now. But what is it about this guy? But John was the one that was entrusted with the future of the things to come. He was the one that got the revelation. And that was the last scene. This is a short version, seven minutes version of a five hours teaching on the life of John. But John is there. He's out on the island of Patmos with a long gray beard. He had been boiled early on. Everybody else is gone. John is the only one left. He's standing out on the island of Patmos and he's looking up towards heaven. He's weary, he's tired and everything else. And he starts to think about these amazing stories that he have had with Jesus. And he's thinking about Jesus. He's reflecting in his age and he's going back in the journey of all these things of the lover of his life. He never can get over Jesus. He's always been full. It doesn't matter. Even at his age, being alone on this island, he's there just undone by the love. And here he is. Whoa! I can see John looking up and I saw it clearly. And I see thunder and lightning. And suddenly the curtain is about to be open. And the king of kings... And the Lord of Lords, a cosmic Christ, not the global Christ, a Christ who rules the universe, is getting the attention to John, a friend and a lover, and he's about to give him all the revelation of the future to come. Do you have the relation? Do you have the revelation of the future that is to come? Can you see clearly? Have you been revealed and been entrusted with the future of the things to come? Oh, I wish I could preach this to you, but there's something available to lovers. That nobody else gets. Peter, James, John all got the glory, raising of the dead. The 12 got the apostolic and the community, the family, and many other things. The 72 got the signs, wonders, and miracle. But it was something that only John got. Would you be that person? Honestly, would you want to be the person that can be entrusted what is the most valuable to him? That has become the dream of my life. That's what lovers do. I want to become impregnated with him, impregnated with his purposes, impregnated with his plan, entrusted, stewarding the very thing that he has given us for this season and this time. I want to love like he loves. My biggest desire is that this very love that the Father has towards the Son, that that love is going to be in us and him in us. Uh, are you getting me? Uh, anyone here, when you're hearing the story of Charles Finney, when was the last time? And maybe you say, well, I had an experience of a little love 20-some years ago. 
how is it now? When you are seeing radical peoples, when you are seeing somebody there, you see a drug addict, what do you see? Do you feel full of love? Are you just looking for somebody you could hug and squeeze and you just feel like you just love people? Are you? Do you know? Some of us are struggling with this love thing. Some of us don't even love ourselves. You cannot love your neighbor if you don't love yourself. And you cannot love yourself fully if you don't know how much he loves you. If you don't have what John had when you're waking up in the morning and you know, I'm the one that he loves. <laughs> Here I am. Whoa. I'm his favorite one, Bobby. Get used to it. Get used to his love. His love towards you. His attractions towards you. Heaven is attracted to the Christ in you. I know there are some nice friends that has come, driven over two hours. And I met with another group of people here last night. And I have a whole stack just of the testimony of the different ones. Telling about how their life was transformed by the love. That was here in Virginia. What was it called? New, not Newport. No, New... Newport News, we were there, Newport News, and wow, it's working in Virginia, the love is. I think some of you, you just, I can see it all over you, you need some love. It's been a little while for some of you. You need some of the Father's love, some of the love of God to change the very DNA of who we are. Some love glasses. Look in the mirror and start to get excited about what you're seeing. You look better when you know that you're well loved. Let's stand to our feet. Some people here, I could see some of the way you're looking at me. It's almost like, no, this, this is almost strange. No, it's normal. It's normal to be loved. Ask, how many of you believe in the John is in the book of Bible, by the way? Let me see. Just wave to me. I'm just getting a little nervous here. Okay. How many of you believe that John 17, 26 is in the Bible? Okay. How many believe that what Jesus said is what he meant? How, how many believe that if Jesus prayed this, that it's going to be answered? Okay. It's, some of you do not agree with That's okay. You can get saved tonight. Do you desire this love? Do you desire the very goodness and the kindness? He's going to offend your mind so that he can touch your heart. So he can touch the real you that just want this love. Do you desire what John had? Be free from fear. John was full of fear. Thunder son. Let's bring fire from heaven. Punish America. Until he had an encounter with love. Now he became the apostle of love. Father, I just, just, I want you just to hold your hands out. Thinking about not just Charles Finney. Not just thinking about a Moody. Not just thinking about a John in the Bible or hearing my story. This is you and him. <laughs> That the very love that the Father has towards the Son, that love that He's going to love you. Say, He's going to love me. Say, the Father's going to love me with that very love, that perfect love. Wow. I'm going to release that love over you now. Father, just take one of those waves and start to send it of that liquid love. Just start here now. More. Just starts to feel it. Here's another wave coming. Liquid love. Let it just starts to touch us. Whoa. Love on us in a way we've never been loved before. Let your love go deeper than it ever did before. I just thank you that you took a Norwegian. Whoa. Tree stump. That was very much like ice. You melted him with your love. <laughs> and now I can't wait to just find somebody to give some sloppy wet kisses to and says, the Father loves you. You're beautiful. You're valuable. <laughs> you look good.
this is the simple message tonight that you're going to wake up in the morning it's just like we saw Paulette that I think is a picture her life was changed if you need healing in your body love heals if you need forgiveness love forgives if you need to forgive somebody else love keeps no record of wrong whatever is your issue I can guarantee you something that love goes in and it changes everything the way we see our community the way we see our nation it changes after the way that we see how he sees us and the father sees you he's noticing you just come forward if you want this love if you want a liquid love we're going to spend some time here just sing some of the love over them and we're just going to be here drinking 